When the Portuguese arrived in Latin America about 500 years ago, they obviously found this amazing tropical forest. And among all this biodiversity that they have never seen before, they found one species that called the attention very quickly. The species, when you cut the, the bark, you find a very dark red resin that was very good to paint and uh, dye fabric to make clothes. The indigenous people call this species Pau Brasil, and that's the reason why this land became land of Brazil and later on Brazil. That's the only country in the world that has a name of a tree. So you can imagine that it's very cool to be a forester in Brazil, <laughs> among other reasons. You know, forest products are all around us. Apart from all those products, forest is very important for climate regulation. In Brazil, almost 70% of the evaporation that makes rain actually comes from the forest. Just the Amazon bombs to the atmosphere 20 billion tons of water every day. This is more than what the Amazon rivers which is the largest river in the world, puts in the sea per day, which is 17 billion tons. If we have to boil water to get the same effect in evapotranspiration, we would need six months of the entire power generation capacity of the world. So it's a hell of a service for all of us. We have in the world about four billion hectares of forests. This is more or less uh, China, US, Canada, and Brazil all together in terms of size, to have an idea. Three quarters of that are in the temperate zone, and just one quarter is on the tropics. But there's one quarter, one billion hectares, holds most of the biodiversity, and very important, 50% of the living biomass, the carbon. Now, we used to have like six billion hectares of forest, 50 percent more than what we have 2,000 years ago. We actually lose two billion hectares in the last 2,000 years, but in the last 100 years, we lose half of that. That was when we shift from deforestation of temperate forests to deforestation of tropical forests. So think of this: in 100 years, we lose the same amount of forests in, in the tropics that we lose in 2,000 years in temperate forests. That's the speed of the destruction that we are having. Now, Brazil is an important piece of this puzzle. We have the second largest forest in the world, just after Russia. It makes 12 percent of the, all the world's forests are in Brazil. Most of that in the Amazon. It's the large piece of forest we have. It's a very big, large area, you can see that you could fit many of the European countries there. We still have 80 percent of the forest cover. That's the good news. But we lost 15 percent in just 30 years. So if we go on this speed, very soon we will lose this powerful pump that we have in the Amazon that regulates our climate. Deforestation was growing fast and accelerating in the end of the 90s and beginning of 2000. Twenty-seven thousand square kilometers in one year. This is 2.7 million hectares. It's almost like half a half of Costa Rica every year. So at this moment, this 2003-2004, I've come to uh, happen to be coming to work in, in the government, and together with another teammates on the National Forest Department, we were assigned a task to join the team and find out the causes of deforestation and make a plan to combat that at national level involving the local governments, the civil society, the business, local communities, on an effort that could tackle those causes. So we come up with this um, plan with 144 actions in different areas. Uh, now I will go to all of them, one by one. No, um, Just giving some examples of what ha we have been done in, in, in the next years. So the first thing, uh, we set up a system with the National Spatial Agency that could actually see where deforestation is happening almost in real time. So we now in Brazil, we have this system, DETER, where every month or every two months, we got information where deforestation is happening. 
So we can actually act when it's happening. And all the information is full transparent so others can replicate that in independent systems. This allows us, between other things, to apprehend 1.4 million cubic meters of logs that were illegally taken. Part of that we uh, saw and sell, and all the revenue become a fund that, are, that now funds conservation projects of local communities as an endowment fund. This also allows us to make a big operations uh, to seize corruption and illegal activities that end up on having 700 people in prison, including a lot of public servants. Then we make the connection that areas that have been working on illegal deforestation should not receive any type of credit or finance. So we cut this through the bank system. And then link this to the end users, so supermarkets, the slaughterhouses, and so on, that buy products from illegal clear-cut areas, they also can be liable for the, the deforestation. So making all these connections to help to push the problem down. And also, we work a lot on land tenure issues. It's very important for conflicts. Uh, 50 million hectares of protected areas were uh, created, which is an area the size of um, probably something like the size of Spain. Um, and from those, 8 million were indigenous, indigenous lands. Now, we start to see uh, results. So in the last 10 years, deforestation come down in Brazil 75%. This is... So if we compare with the average deforestation that we have on the last decade, uh, we save 8.7 million hectares, which is the size of Austria. But more important, it avoids the emission of 3 billion tons of CO2 in the atmosphere. This is uh, by far the largest contribution to reduce greenhouse gas emissions until today as a positive action. Uh, one may think that when you do this type of actions to decrease, um, to push down deforestation, you will have an economic impact. Then, because you're not having economic activities or something like that. But it's interesting to know that it's quite the opposite. In fact, on the period that we have the deepest decline on deforestation, the economy grow in average double that on the previous decade when deforestation was actually going up. So it's a good lesson for us. Maybe this is completely disconnected, and we just learn by having the deforestation come down. Now, these are all good news, um, and we sh it's a quite an achievement, and we obviously should be very proud about that, um, but it's not even close to sufficient. In fact, if you think about the deforestation in the Amazon in 2013, that was over half a million hectares. It means that every minute, to an area the size of two soccer fields has been cut in the Amazon last year, just last year. If we sum up the deforestation that we have in the other biomas in Brazil, we are talking about still the largest deforestation rate in the world. It's more or less like we are like forest heroes, but still deforestation champions. So we can't be satisfied, not even close to satisfied. So the next step, I think, is to fight to have zero loss of forest cover in Brazil, and to have that as a goal for 2020. That's our next step. Now, I've always been interested on the relationship of climate change and forests. First, because 15% of greenhouse gas emissions come from deforestation, so it's a big part of the problem. But also, forests can be a big part of the solution, since that's the best way we know to sink, capture, and store carbon. Now, there is another relationship of climate and forest that really struck me in 2008 and made me change my career from forest to working with climate change. I went to visit Canada in British Columbia uh, together with um, uh, the chiefs of the forest services of other countries that we have a kind of alliance of, of them, like Canada, Russia, India, China, US. And while we were there, we, we learn about this uh, pine beetle that is literally eating the forests in Canada. What we see here, uh, those um, brown uh, trees, these are really dead trees. They're standing dead trees because of this, uh, lo the larva of this beetle. What happens is that th this beetle is controlled by the cold weather in the winter. But for many years now, they don't have the sufficient cold weather to actually 
control the population of this beetle, and it became an, uh, uh, a, a disease that is really killing billions of trees. So I came back with this notion that forest is actually one of the earliest and most um, affected victims of climate change. So I was thinking, if, if, if I succeed and working with all my colleagues to actually help to stop deforestation, maybe we will lose the battle later on for climate change but in, by floods, heat, fires, and so on. So I decided to leave the Forest Service and, and start to work directly on, on climate change. Find a way to think, understand the challenge and, and go for them. Now, so the challenge of climate change is pretty straightforward. The goal is very clear. We want to limit the increase of the average temperature in the planet in two degrees. There are several reasons for that. I will not get into that now. But in order to get to this limit of two degrees, which was possible for us to survive, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, defines that we have a budget of emissions of 1,000 billion tons of CO2 from now to the end of the century. So if we divide this by the number of years, what we have is an average budget of 11 billion tons of CO2 per year. Now, what is one ton of CO2? It's, it's more or less what one small car running 20 kilometers a, uh, a day will emit in one year. Or it's one flight one way from Sao Paulo to Johannesburg or to London, one way, two ways, two tons. So 11 billion tons is twice that. Now, the emissions today are 50 billion tons. And it's growing. It's growing and maybe will be on 61 by 2020. Now, we, ha we need to go down to 10 by 2050. And while this happens, the population will grow from 7 to 9 billion people. The economy will grow from $60 trillion in 2010 to $200 trillion. And so what we need to do is to be much more efficient in a way that we can go from 7 tons of carbon per capita per person per year into something like one. You have to choose. So you take the, the airplane or you have a car. So the question is, can we make it? And that's exactly the same question I got when I was um, developing the plan to combat deforestation. It's got so big problem, so complex, can we really do it? So I think so. Think of this. The deforestation means 60% of the greenhouse gas emissions in Brazil in the last decade. Now it's a little bit less than 30%. In the world, it's 60% is energy. So if we can tackle directly the energy the same way we could tackle deforestation, maybe we can have a chance. So there are five things that I think we should, we should do. First, we need to disconnect development from carbon emissions. We don't need to clear cut the forests, all the forests, to actually get more jobs in agriculture and have more economy. That's what we prove when we decrease deforestation, the economy continues to grow. Same things could happen when in, the, in the energy sector. Second, we have to move the incentives to the right place. Today, $500 billion a year goes into subsidies to fossil fuels. Why don't we put a price on carbon and transfer this to the renewable energy? Third, we need to measure and make it transparent where, when, and who is emitting greenhouse gases. So we can have actions specific to each one of those opportunities. Fourth, we need to leapfrog the roots of development, which means you don't need to go to a landline telephone before you get to the, to the mobile phones. Same way we don't need to go to fossil fuels, to the one billion people that don't have access to energy, before we get to the clean energy. And fifth and last, we need to share responsibilities between governments, business, and civil society. There are work to do for everybody, and, then, and we need to have everybody on board. So to finalize, I think, um, you know, future is not like a fate that you have to just to go as business as usual goes. We need to have the courage to actually change the route, testing something new, think that we can actually change the route. 
I think we are doing this uh, with deforestation in Brazil, and I hope we can do it also with climate change in the world. Thank you.